Hi folks, thanks for coming out again. Uh, this is the November installment of our Labrador Institute speaker series. We've been trying to do these one a month. Uh, we started last February, I guess, so I think they're number nine or so. Um, we're actually trying to do this every month, one every month. Uh, we don't have a specific date during the month that we do it, but we just try and take advantage of uh, Dan coming to town and uh, uh, take uh, get them to come in and talk about uh, some of their interests and their expertise. So. Um, my name is Scott Nielsen. For those of you who don't know, I work for the Labrador Institute and uh, for the Archaeology Department at Memorial University. Um, I live here in Northwest River, and my office is just upstairs if you ever need to uh, find me. Today we have uh, one of Northwest River's own, I guess, coming in for the first time to give us a talk, and it's uh, Ann Budgel, uh, also well known uh, CPC radio personality throughout the day. Um, and we also um, we also video these talks as well, and it's actually live streamed um, on the internet so the people elsewhere in Labrador who can't make it here to Northwest River to see the talk are able to watch. So in the future, if you can't get in here to watch, you can always watch it on the internet or go to the Labrador Institute YouTube channel and watch the talks there because they're all archived. So anybody that we've had in the past, they're all there and available for people to watch. Um, and tonight's going to be talking about her uh, interest in the, the Grand River, as people here like Churchill River, as it is on the provincial maps, I guess, or uh, Mr. Shippu, as it will be called across the river. Or the Hamilton. Or the Hamilton River, that's right, the river of many names, and I guess it's big enough that it can handle all those names. So, without further ado, I'll give you Ann Budgel. Thank you, Scott. You're welcome. Uh, don't worry about that bang, it's just the air in the pipes will go away shortly. <laughs> um, this is a talk I was telling some people earlier. Almost a year ago, of the Newfoundland Historical Society. So I really put a lot of history in here. I thought when I was writing my book, I, I did do a chapter on the uh, exploration of the of the Grand River and all these explorers who came. Uh, but I thought, well, I'm going to get this organized and talk about it a little bit more. Um, what I found, you know, and anybody who's done any reading about Labrador knows that when you look at all the books and magazines and the journal articles that are written about Labrador, the earliest ones are about the coast, where there was cod fishing, sealing, and whaling going on. But in the 19th century, so the 1800s, Accounts began to trickle out about the sites that were seen in the interior of Labrador as the fur traders and the missionaries encroached on the territory that was then occupied only by Inu people who traveled back and forth from the north shore of Quebec to the north coast of Labrador hunting caribou. The land was unmapped, it was mysterious, it was one of the few places left on the planet for an aspiring explorer to make a reputation. And there was a tremendous waterfall word had it that it might have been one or two thousand feet high nobody knew for sure well tonight i'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the explorers who made this difficult trip into the labrador interior by way of the grand river as we know is still called by labrador people mishta shiku by Inu people it was renamed hamilton and then later churchill river i'm going to compare some of the methods and efforts made by these earlier explorers with that of an expedition I wrote about in my book. Because among all the letters and the diaries that I worked with, in the book that's up there, and called Dear Everybody, there was one short diary written during the summer of 1946 about an expedition to Grand Falls by canoe and foot, made by Barbara Mundy, who was from New York City, as many, many of you know. Her then boyfriend, her, uh, she hadn't married him yet, Trapper Russell Groves, John Lake from Northwest River and Mud Lake, and Russell's half-sister, Nora Groves, who was from Groves Point. So those four young people, they were then, made this trip in 1946, and, I, and she wrote a little account of it. So when I read Barbara's account of her trip up the river with her three friends, I was really struck by the contrast from the stories with the 19th and the 20th century explorers who published their accounts as books, or sometimes as transcripts of talks that they gave to the Explorers Club or the Historical Societies or the Geographical Societies in New York and Philadelphia and places like that. 
Not all of them achieved their objective of getting up to the falls, and some of them nearly drowned or almost starved in the attempt. But Barbara Mundy's month-long trip, nearly month-long trip to the falls and back, she described as wonderful fun. <laughs> I'm going to start with Randall F. Holm, H-O-L-M-E. He stood up in front of the members of the Royal Geographical Society at their evening meeting in London, February the 15th, 1888, to report on the journey he made to the interior of Labrador between July and October 1887. Coastal fishermen, he said, found Labrador to be an abomination of desolation. Not a tree to be seen, he said, an almost perpetual winter. No wonder, he said, it's almost universally avoided. That's what he reported back to people in London. He had wonderful eyewitness news for this assembly about the least known part of the British colonies. If you ventured in through Hamilton Inlet, he said, not more than 12 miles as he had done, he, he said, there commences a luxuriant forest growth. And the climate is totally different, he said. I ship into the inlet more of 100 miles, and you will find the mouth of a massive river, he's reporting to all these people in England. However, and you will find the mysterious Grand Falls, rumored to be higher than Niagara Falls. In the late 19th century, the falls had not yet been measured or photographed, and so they became a prime objective for explorers who wanted to make a name for themselves. In his talk to the Geographical Society, Holm summarized the exploration record of the interior of Labrador to that date. Hudson's Bay Company trader John McLean was first to publish an account of seeing the falls. He was there in August 1839, and he said that it was one of the grandest spectacles of the world. He said he could feel the rock shake under his feet from the force of the water surging into this big, deep canyon. Various other Hudson's Bay Company agents traveled in the Labrador interior in those years, much more concerned with establishing new trading posts on the good fur lands and in finding a reliable land route between their posts than surveying the famous falls. They were trying to connect the trading posts up in the northern Angava Peninsula with the ones down here. That was really what they were all about, not, not really about identifying the falls. Now, another British geologist, Henry Ewell Hind, H-I-N-D, that is, he led an expedition in 1861 on the Moise River, and he published his Explorations in the Interior of the Labrador Peninsula. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that because that's been reissued in recent years. And uh, Mr. Holm, the guy I was just talking about a minute ago, he said that Heinz's journey uh, earlier wasn't properly speaking a journey in Labrador, but rather it was in the Canadian province of Quebec. There was a Roman Catholic priest whose name was Zachary Lacasse, and he had traveled to Northwest River with Inu guides from Mingan on the Quebec North Shore. By way of the Mingan and the Kenemu Rivers, he did this several times between 1876 and 1880 but he didn't attempt to get up the Grand River as far as the falls. So these are just some of the people who were at least mentioning the river and getting into the interior, if not all the way to the falls. So Randall Holm, this Englishman I was talking about, he figured that since 1864, when the Hudson's Bay Company abandoned Fort Nascopi in what we would now call Western Labrador, he figured there hadn't been another white man on the Grand River until he and his party went there in 1887. At least he couldn't find one in the, the written records. So I guess it depends by what you mean by white man. Uh, to help him go up the river, Randall Holm hired John Montague, who would be an ancestor of many people in Northwest River and here in this room tonight, I'm sure. He was then a 28-year-old Scot. He had been in Labrador for 13 years. And another fellow who was hired by Holm was named Flett, F-L-E-T, and he was also from the Orkney Islands, but he was, he was a bit older. In fact, Mr. Holm said that Flett was past prime of life, but he knew the river. He was worth Many other men and women, mostly not white, had camped and traveled on that river, as we know. Geologists have found artifacts on the riverbanks and the banks of its tributaries dating back Scott, four or five thousand years? Uh, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, but the written record was sparse. And Holmes' trip upriver is one of the most complete ones. He also took photographs. And I wish I had one on my laptop I could have shown you. Uh, these photographs can be seen at the Center for Newfoundland Studies, which is at the library at Memorial University in St. John's. And it has an incredible photograph of poor old John Montague hauling a wooden boat through the woods on portage, a big, like a dory, you know, hauling it, he, him and another man. Uh, I should point out that by the time the English or American explorers got to Northwest River on the shore of Lake Melville, they probably felt they had already earned their explorer's badges. This was already to them like you're in the deep, dark wilderness, even by getting just to Northwest River. Randall Holm left England on the 5th of July. He got to St. John's on July the 13th, and he got to Northwest River by July 29th. For the Innu and the trappers who frequented the country, of course, it's their home country, nothing strange about it, and there were numerous settlements, portage paths, camps on every significant body of water, had a name, of course, all these things were named, subject to being changed by the newcomers who, who dropped in. For explorers like home, Northwest River was the middle of nowhere. And from there you ventured into the complete unknown. Explorers came equipped with the latest technology of the day. They had instruments to measure water depth. They had meteorological conditions and elevation, uh, uh, technical instruments that they could measure and, and record all these things. Some of them had cameras, and then later on, some of them even had movie cameras. They were going to put this place on the map, and that was how they were going to establish their reputation. So Mr. Holm and his party visited some of the settlements in Lake Melville, and they noted at that time of the year, everybody was fishing salmon. And on August 24th, he and Montague, John Montague and Mr. Flett, started up Grand River in a wooden fisherman's dinghy. And Holmes said that it was light as such boats go, but it was still almost more than three minutes. Well, what a time they had hauling that boat through the forest. When they got to the first portage at uh, Muskrat Falls, it took them all day using a block and tackle to lift the boat up the steep path 210 feet, and then they had to drag it half a mile through the woods, and then down 140 feet to the river again. They probably were thinking, what are we doing? You know, let's get out of here. But like I said, Holm had a photograph of Montague and Flett struggling with the dory in the tall forest, which was crisscrossed with dead fallen trees. In his speech to the Geographical Society, Mr. Holmes said that he knew a canoe would have been more suitable, but he said, this is a quote from him, as my crew consisted of white men who were less accustomed to canoes, I had been compelled to take a boat. <laughs> anyway, these portages were killing, and it was summer heat, flies chewing them to pieces, and Montague and Flett probably wished they had stayed fishing salmon with everybody else. By September the 10th, two and a half weeks since they started their trip, they were at Lake Winnicapow, where Grand River widens, as you'll see if you look at that map, it widens out, so it becomes a very long lake. And it is famous for windy conditions and the inhospitable rock cliffs that come straight up out of the water. You know, there aren't as many landing places and beaches up there in Winnicapow. They were windbound there, and Holm calculated they would soon run out of food. So the expedition turned around, went back, and they made it downriver to Grand uh, to Muskrat Falls in just three and a half days. Of course, they had the flow of the water with them, and they were able to go very quickly. So Mr. Holm did not see the falls, but he figured that he was perhaps within 50 miles of them, and he guessed that they were 2,000 feet high. Uh, gee, I don't know how he figured that out. But he based this on... Professor Hines' report of 15 years or so earlier that the elevation of the Labrador tableland from where the waters feed the falls, he figured, was 140 feet above sea level. So he subtracted from that huh, the descent at Muskrat Falls of 70 feet, and he rounded it off, and, and, and there you are. He got uh, 2,000 feet. Holm told his audience in England, he said, it therefore seems probable that there is no other fall in the world of such volume of water so high or of so great height with such volume of water. He was wrong, of course, but his published account may have stirred, probably did stir up a lot more interest in these stupendous, mysterious falls. 
Now I'm going to talk about stuff that happened in 1891 when two expeditions of Americans were to attempt to measure and photograph the falls. One group from Bowdoin College in Maine got out ahead of the other ones by a few days. The Bowdoin boys, as they were called, were recent graduates of the college and they were among a group of 19 young men accompanying Professor Leslie Lee on his scientific field trip that summer. Four young men, Austin Carey, Dennis Cole, W.R. Smith, and E.B. Young, left the main group and they started up Grand River in two canoes. There was just the four of them. They did not have any local guides. And from the book, Bowden Boys in Labrador by Jonathan Prince Silly Jr., he said that the decision to do without local guides was a wise one from what he had seen of native Labradorians. The Bowden Boys didn't think the Labrador men could keep up with them. <laughs> Silly wrote, this is what he said, the Indians, he said, cannot stand the pace our men intend to strike. And while he allowed that they would have some local knowledge that might add to the comfort of the party, this is what he said, it's very doubtful any living person has ever been to the falls or knows any more about the last and probably hardest part of the trip than Austin Carey. <laughs> so you can imagine where this is going. On July the 26th, the expedition schooner Julia A. Decker, which was anchored four miles from the mouth of Grand River, uh, and two American-made Rushton cedar canoes, which were 15 feet long and each weighing 80 pounds, were put over the side. At least they didn't take a fishing dory. On August the 1st at Horseshoe Rapids, one canoe capsized and everything in it was lost, including the instruments needed to measure the falls. This was due to what they said was a failure to fasten the stores into the boats before starting as had been ordered. Somebody didn't follow orders. On August the 7th, when they reached Lake Winnicapow, Young and Cole turned back. They determined that they did not have enough provisions for four men, and Young had injured his hand. So Carrie and Cole pressed on, and on August the 10th, Carrie was thrown out of the canoe in the swift water, but he wasn't hurt. On August the 13th, they heard the sound of the falls. So they made camp, they cached their food, they hauled up the canoe, making their way on foot, they saw the falls. They made measurements and they took photographs. They wrote their names and the date on a piece of paper and they placed it in a small glass bottle, leaving it where it would be seen. Carrie and Cole continued with their surveying and on August the 15th, they returned to their main camp to find everything burned and still smoking. Nearly all their food, their tent and their canoe were destroyed when the improperly extinguished campfire flared up after they left to see the falls. They salvaged what little they could, they made a rough raft, and then they set down the river, set out down the river. After a week of almost nothing to eat, on August the 23rd, they found a bear's heart and liver, and on August 24th, they arrived at a food cache they had left on the way up the river. Well, the raft by this time was in a ruin, so they had to make another one. And they managed to get to Traverston River, the home of Joseph Michelin, on August the 28th. And by then, their shoes were absolutely in tatters. They had their feet wrapped in rags, and they were weak with hunger. Uh, Joe Michelin brought them to Northwest River two days later, and they rejoined the rest of the Bowdoin boys who were anxiously awaiting their return, wondering what happened to them. Well, off they sailed back down to the United States, and Carrie and Cole were hailed as heroes. When the expedition arrived in Nova Scotia on the way home to Maine, the premier of Nova Scotia hosted a reception in their honor. The church bells rang in tribute when they arrived at Rockland, Maine. They named the canyon on Grand River after their college, and it is still called Bowdoin Canyon. The photos they said they took were never published as far as I can tell. Uh, other photos of their expedition can be seen on a Maine history website that I referenced in my book, but there are no photos of the Grand River or the Grand Falls. I wonder what happened to those photos. They might have been damaged by uh, moisture or, or something like that. That summer, there was another competing expedition, and this was Henry G. Bryan of Philadelphia and C.A. Keniston of Washington. And like the Bowdoin boys, they wanted to be the first to photograph and measure this great cataract. But unlike the Bowdoin boys, they were keen to hire local guides, and they seemed quite dismayed that people were busy 
salmon fishing and with other of their own activities. Bryant saw this as what he said was a natural disinclination to engage in an undertaking involving so much hard work. He said people didn't want to work for them because they didn't want to do any hard work. But lucky for him, Mr. Keniston, John Montague and an Inuit man named Jeffrey Van were willing to guide them. So I'm trying to imagine John Montague's thoughts when he saw the 500 pound wooden boat similar to the one that he had manhandled through the bush for Randall Holm four years earlier. The Bryant expedition took one Russian canoe in addition to this big heavy wooden boat. On August the 3rd, they left Northwest River making Muskrat Falls Portage three days later, out with the block and tackle. And once again, the heavy wooden boat is being hauled uphill almost 200 feet, took a day and a half. And then the boat is back in the water, but remember, you're going against the current if you are paddling or sailing, you are going backwards. When you come to shallows, rapids, falls, or other tricky places, you have to get out of the boat and haul it upstream with ropes. Once, when their canoe capsized, unfortunately nothing was lost. Another time, the canoe got caught in swift water while they were towing it, and it pulled Bryant and Montague into the river. They made it to Lake Winnicapow by the 20th of August. They checked the depths of the lake at 406 feet, and they noted all these big granite cliffs rising on both sides. This was all happening at the same time as the half-starved Bowden boys were rafting down with a kapow. But that's a big wide lake at that point, and they didn't see each other. They passed each other. But comparing the dates published by each group, they were on Lake Winnicapow at the same time, going in opposite directions. By September the 2nd, Brian Keniston and Mr. Montague made it to Grand Falls. Jeffrey Band stayed behind at their main camp on the river. They took the measurements, they determined the principal fall to be 316 feet high, and they figured the water level was down 10 feet from its height during the spring runoff. And they did take some photographs, which were somewhat damaged by the large amount of moisture in the air. Their provisions were getting low, and they began their trip back to the main camp. They got lost, they wandered in the cold and they wet, and they said they only had enough flour remaining for one meal, and their condition was unpleasant in the extreme. But they found their way, much to Jeffrey Mann's relief. He's there waiting at their campsite. Back on the river, the fast water carried them down with exhilarating speed in just seven days. Bryant wrote an article called The Grand Falls of Labrador, and it was published in the Century magazine in September of 1892, and there were illustrations drawn from their imperfect photographs. And he mentioned that they had put their names in the bottle, the Bowden Boys bottle. But oddly, in the listing, of the names of the bottle, which was published by the department, it was called in 1968. Uh, Bryant and Keniston's names do not appear. Canadian geologist Albert Peter Lowe put the earlier explorers to shame. He graduated from McGill University in 1892 and he joined the Dominion Geological Survey. In 1893, he began a thorough investigation of the Ungava Peninsula, lasting 16 months surveying thousands of miles of rivers and lakes and amassing a collection of over 200 rock samples. He started out on the north shore of Quebec in June, went overland to Fort Chimo with four guides he hired in Quebec, using the river routes that were well known to the Innu and the Hudson's Bay Company traders. They hitched a ride on a Hudson's Bay Company vessel from Fort Chimo to Rigolette, and then they came into Northwest River, arriving in October when, of course, all the local trappers had gone into the country. So they stayed over the winter. In uh, February 1894, when the trappers came back, A.P. Lowe hired 13 of them for a dollar a day, including John Montague again, to haul provisions and other gear up the Grand River in addition to the four guys that he had from Quebec. So he had no qualms at all about uh, hiring local labor. He planned to spend months exploring and thousands of pounds of food were hauled up river and cash for him and his party. Five trappers stayed with Lowe until April, April 2nd, but by then they were uh, at the height of land and he figured they were eating more provisions than their work was worth, so he dismissed them and they went back to Northwest River with a credit note uh, to take to the Hudson's Bay Company store. A.P. Lowe saw the Grand Falls on May the 14th, 1894, and he said that the deep booming sound could be heard 10 miles away. He figured the falls were about 302 feet high, which is getting close to the actual height of 245 feet. And he calculated the volume of water, 50,000 cubic feet per second, which was amazingly accurate. Later that year, he discovered large quantities of high-grade iron ore in western Labrador. 
After 16 months investigating the Quebec Labrador Peninsula, he returned to Ottawa to write up his findings, and they were published in 1895 as a report on explorations in the Labrador Peninsula on the East Main, Coxsoac, <coughs> Hamilton, Manicouagan, and portions of other rivers in 1892, 3, 4, and 5, and his name is also in the bottle. Well, the bottle, the famous bottle, gives us one way of knowing how much traffic there was on the Grand River and around the Grand Falls of Labrador. Trappers from Northwest River had established trap lines at the height of land by the early 20th century, and as more men took up trapping, they had to go farther away from home to find ground that had not already been claimed. We don't know how many trips up and down the river, but he drowned in 1902 while he was tracking his canoe at Gull Island Rapids. Campbell, another name some people may know, it's not a name familiar to some Americans there in 1908. Now I want to show you this lady. I got covered up here. Um, Fred Gowdy, who some of you will remember for sure, he had a trap light at the height of land and he guided a woman to the falls in 1913. And she might be the very first non-Inu woman to see the falls. And I wish I knew more about her. Lori Coates, she was a nurse with the Grenfell Mission. She was from England, but she graduated from a nursing program in Philadelphia. And when I first looked at the names that were in the bottle, I mistakenly assumed that Lori Coates was a man. Since according to the entry in the bottle, she had gone to the falls accompanied only by Fred Gowdy. There were no other names mentioned. And I just didn't think that a woman at that time would have done that. But there might have been other men who had gone along and hadn't put their names in the bottle. Anyway, this um, newspaper story was from an American paper, as you can see, Spokane, Washington. But there was one also in the Toronto Star dated November the 28th, 1913, and Dateline, New York. And it said that she had arrived in New York by the steamer Stefano, so that she would have come from St. John's, and she told the reporter that she made the trip upriver, she said, in company with a half-breed Indian guide. Now, um, oh, sorry, I'm too far. This is just blowing up the text that was under her picture. Um, they traveled by... Um, canoe, of course, for uh, most of the 325 miles of Grand Falls, and they lost one canoe in this trip. So there must have been other men along, right? She probably wasn't in her own canoe. A little more than a week later, she was mentioned in this newspaper in Spokane, Washington, under the headline that you saw long ago, Woman Pierces Labrador Wilds. In the summer of 1914, Lori Coates was in Calgary, Alberta, visiting her sister, I found another reference to her, and it said that she intended to go back to England and enlist, and the war had been declared, and she's a nurse, and she wanted to serve on the battlefield. Somebody's going to have to do a little bit more research to find out what happened to Nurse Lori Coates. But I, I was really pleased that I found out about her and who she was. So for 12 years, uh, from Lori Coates, and uh, Fred Gowdy being there, the only names in the bottle are of Labrador men until New Yorker Varick Frizzell and his party got there on July the 30th, 1925. He and his friend James Hellyer were using the information and maps published by A.P. Lowe, and they did hire trappers as guides. The Labrador men didn't bother to put their names in the bottle, but we know that John Michelin, Judson Blake, Fred Gowdy, and Robert Michelin went along with Varick Frizzell. We don't know from the article that Frizzell published in the Geographical Journal in 1927, though, because he only said that two white trappers from Northwest River Post who traveled almost to the height of land in winter came with us as guides, didn't put their names in the newspaper. John Michelin was interviewed for Them Days magazine in 1975, and he named everybody who was there. In addition to the four Labrador men, there was a priest, McCarthy, W.G. Malone, a cook whose name he forgot, and there was another man, Fournier, whose name is in the bottle. Michelin, remember, the priest said mass at the falls. I think more than one expedition went up the river at the same time, in this case, and they all traveled together. 
Well, it took them 17 days to get to the Big Hill Portage that would take them to Grand Falls, and Frizzell noted that his guides said that the river was swollen from many recent rainstorms, running higher than they had ever seen. He wanted to be the first to get good pictures at the falls, not just still pictures, but moving pictures. And thanks to my friend Nigel Markham, I have a little bit of that film to show you this evening. Uh, Nigel projected, <laughs> he had the actual film, and he projected it on a screen like that and shot it with slightly reduced in quality. Uh, I've got it on a DVD, and Scott is going to show it on, uh, on this TV screen. So this is film that was shot in 1925. There's, uh, there are a couple of seats up here in front. Oh, of course, that thing is in the way. We can move this thing out of the way right now while we're looking at the uh, film. was arriving. There's a picture of the Northwest River before you get up the river. Senior O'Brien, Father O'Brien, he was then. <laughs> Sports day. Those children are still alive, they're a hundred years old. <laughs>
Wouldn't you love to know who that is? Is that John? Yeah. It could be. He was part of the group. Robert Mission there. No wonder everybody was so impressed. <laughs> Pretty impressive.
points to him for getting the movie camera out while that's going on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It wasn't badly, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very for now, 1925. So John Michelin, who was on that trip, uh, when he was interviewed in Them Days magazine, he said that Frizzell showed him the film a couple of times, and he said that it was a good trip. So John Michelin was becoming the go-to man for expeditions to the falls. He was then hired later by German-American Herman J. Kohler, and they wandered all over the Ungava Peninsula getting to Grand Falls, not by the river this time, but from the interior. They got there in September of 1928, and Kohler left his name in the bottle too. Michelin described traveling with him as tough, he said, with not much growth. He told Kohler that they'd need four bags of flour, and Kohler bought 10-pound bags instead of 50-pound bags. <laughs> when they got to the falls, Kohler's son's hands was barefoot. Michelin gave him some old boots left at one of his tilts. Uh, Kohler died in mysterious circumstances in Labrador on another expedition in 1930-31. Apparently, John Michelin would not go with him that time. Kohler's Labrador guide, Jim Martin, is believed to have died on that trip. His body was never found. John Michelin had other clients in 1930. American writer Elliot Merrick and his wife Kate Austin accompanied him to his trap line at the height of land. And Merrick wrote beautifully about their winter in the Labrador interior in his book True North, and their names went in the bottle on Christmas Day in 1930. And over the next 10 to 15 years, many who came to the falls were prospectors and surveyors, and then during wartime, exploration activity really slowed down. Only a couple of names are entered between 1932 and 1946, although some trappers continued to go upriver all the way and through the war, but uh, many others, of course, uh, took jobs at the base in Goose Bay. Trapper Raymond Mesher drowned at Meninope Rapid in 1944 when his tracking line wrapped around his leg and his loaded canoe pulled him into the river. He was one of the most experienced rivermen at that point, and his body apparently was never found. So that's some of the history of uh, the exploration. But now finally I want to tell you about an expedition that was done in 1946. And this one was described in a short diary and I included the whole story in my book. And of course the, the person who wrote about it was Barbara Mundy Groves. I've got some pictures here. And just to tell you a little bit about her, I'm sure a lot of you know this, but for those of you who don't, in 1944, she came to Northwest River as a volunteer with the International Grenfell Association to work in their industrial shop. Well, you bear in mind that I wrote this talk for people in St. John's, right? So I had to take them the whole down. Uh, what we would now call the craft shop. And she was from Park Avenue in Manhattan, and she, of course, was a staunch Grenfell Mission supporter and volunteer. And in New York, she'd served on several committees that brought her in regular contact with Dr. Wilfred Grenfell and she corresponded with him in her role as secretary for the Needlework Guild of America's Labrador Coast to Coast branch. In 1935, she was one of a couple dozen volunteers helping out at the IGA offices and other projects in St. Anthony. And nine years later, in 1944, she volunteered to go to Labrador, thinking she would only stay for six months. But she enjoyed the place, she enjoyed her work, and she fell in love. So her plans changed. In 1946, after two years' service for the mission in Northwest River, she had not renewed her contract track to work with the mission. By then, she was involved in a romantic relationship with Russell Groves, who was widowed fur trapper. Up Grand River, not as far as the height of land, he went into the country south of Lake Winnicapow River. Barbara really wanted to see the Grand River that she heard so many trappers talking about, and she really wanted to see the falls, like her friends Bud Merrick and Kate Austin had done with uh, John Michelin. So she and Russell planned this trip and his half-sister Nora came along for appearances and trapper John Blake from uh, Mud Lake, who was a friend of theirs. And they also brought Russell's dog Flop along just for fun. So Barbara hired a motorboat to take them as far as Muskrat Falls. But on the way, they had to go over to uh, Mud Lake and pick up John Blake, Grace Gowdy's, uh, I don't know her, does anybody know who Grace Gowdy is? I think that's what that says, right? Uncle Joe Blake and Mrs. So there's uh, John's parents. So they picked him up there. 
and uh, Barbara loved uh, Uncle Joe and uh, Mrs. Blake. She wrote very affectionately about them in, in her diary. And she hired a motorboat to tow them as far as Muskrat Falls, which is what trappers, trappers normally would do. They made camp on the portage path above the falls on August the 15th. The two women helped carry things up over the path, including a guitar. And over the next three days, Bar uh, Russell tracked the canoe. Oh, there's Muskrat Falls. Sorry, should have shown you that one a moment ago. And that this is her handwriting. This is from an album that actually uh, Barbara's daughter Marjorie donated to the museum here. So this album is actually here in the old Hudson's Bay Company store in the museum there. And I took photographs of the photographs. So that's where these ones came from. <clears throat> So there they are starting out. She put all this in an album afterwards, but those are her dates. So this is how you know how long things are taking. Where am I? And so over the next uh, three days, Russell tracked the canoe through Rattle Brook below sandbanks. Barbara stayed in the canoe and she steered. They pulled and steered through Porcupine Rapid. There's Russell pulling through Porcupine Rapid. And they felt the strong current at Gull Island Lake. Grizzles Rapid and Gull Island Rapid. Um, Barbara described those as real ones, real rapids. She was steering and she noted the high hills on both sides and she, she wrote very beautifully, dew drop diamonds on fluted leaves near where they camped on sand below a trapper's tilt. And on August the 18th, three days into the trip, she wrote such wonderful fun. The next day they tackled the Horseshoe Rapids. Boys are obviously trying to catch a truck there. And Bob's Brook and Lower and Middle Rapids, which they tracked with uh, a bow line. And they had a mug up and they crossed the river and they paddled a while and then crossed back again beyond Menifee Island. They planted some flower seeds in memory of Uncle Fred Gowdy at the, this place, marking the, it with rocks because he had drowned 1944, 45, I forget now which year it was. And Barbara knew him and thought a lot of him and his daughter Doris worked with her in the craft shop. So in Uncle Fred's memory, she planted John Blake's canoe was swamped, and they lost a boiler and a paddle. Oh, I'll tell you about that in a minute. On August the 20th, they had a double tracking line for the rest of Menenope Rapid, and then they were in slack waters, a nice, calm, and peaceful place. And she thought that the flowers among the shore rocks were beautiful. On August the 21st, they investigated Cyril Michelin's cabin, and she pronounced it messy. <laughs> the place names she mentioned there were Samson's Rub, Allen's Island, and Elsie's Island. Someone shot a nancery, so they had supper, and trout and jackfish were in all the little streams. On August the 22nd, they picked up a larger canoe at the Squirrel River Tilt. They checked out Leslie's house, house that was probably Leslie Becky, and they scavenged a bread pan for a stove collar piece, and they caught some trout and they camped at Mooney Island. On August the 23rd, they visited Mark's clean house, and they saw Warren's old canoe on a scaffold. The boys pulled, and she steered, which she said was lots of fun. They saw Arch and Jim Gowdy paddling around the bend while they were boiling up at Shoal River. She wrote a short letter to give to her mother, and she figured she would get Arch or Jim to carry it down to the river when they passed by again in a day or so. Barbara said she broke her finger at Devil's Hole. But that was the last mention of it. Couldn't have been very serious. I I put this photograph in. Um, just I, I don't know where this one was taken. She didn't label it. Maybe somebody recognizes where that is. But I just thought it's just another nice, nice river photograph. Um, it looks like about Devil's Hole, just before you get into it. Oh, okay. Well, that's right on then. Uh, where the powers, everybody knows, is where the river widens out into this deep, long lake. And Barbara said the mountains were quite high, and they killed some ducks there. And that night they camped in the ashes without putting up a tent, thinking they might go on while the big lake was calm. 
but they overslept and they started out again the next morning after killing a porcupine. They killed more ducks on August the 24th. As they paddled Lake Winnicapow, they saw Jimmy Becky's tilt and they stopped at Wilfred Becky's tilt near Fox Island. And there's a picture of it there. And uh, they had to clean up some of the damage that was done by a bear so that they could sleep in the tilt. On the 25th of August, they stopped to see the site of the old Hudson's Bay Company post on Wolf Island, finding old bricks on the ground. On August the 27th, they were at Edward Michelin's trapping place and shooting raspberries. On to Three Square Island, where they hoped to pick up a larger canoe, but it was ruined by bears. They spotted a bear, but they weren't quick enough to get him. Barbara noted that the river was full of rapids above this point and they wouldn't be able to go much farther in a canoe. And then they came to the Big Hill Portage, which is the steep climb to the path that would lead them to the falls. I'm not sure that photograph was taken in 1946, but she took this photograph and it might have been another, another time, another portage. But anyway, just a photograph of a portage. So they were nearly at the height of land and they had been gone for 12 days. On August the 28th, she wrote that Russell and John staggered up the hill with one canoe while she and Nora cluttered up the bushes with laundry. She said they left enough water in the lake for duck hunting. <laughs> More ducks were shot and she had a swim and she shot partridge for supper. On Sunday the 29th, which is the traditional day of rest, strictly observed by trappers, it was raining in the morning so they stayed in their camp. She wrote that John was playing the guitar, Nora was sewing tops on deerskin boots, and she said Russell was being lazy. At 11.30, they rallied and they began hiking over grassy bogs, paddling small lakes, and heading toward the Grand Falls. And they camped at Hard Shoe Lake. And Barbara said she made the most wonderful bread. The next day, she wrote that John was in hip waders and Russell was in his rompers, wallowing in the mud, cursing and swearing all the way, pushing and pulling the canoe through a lake they called Humbug Lake. Up found a pork pine and they killed it. They struggled through more rough portages and they killed three geese and they heard the falls. August the 31st, they saw the falls. <coughs> a picture of the canyon here. Uncle Fred's old Martin path was the one they used to get to their vantage point on the north side of the river. Barbara said it was rocky, mossy, rough country, boulder field swamps, and lily ponds once in a while. They could see the spray from the... Suddenly they were out on a cliff high above Bowden Canyon, she wrote, boiling water, snow bank, and green, green fields on the south side. They found bottle, and she wrote that it was lavender with age, and they read all the notes that were in the bottle. 1891, the first one, and the most recent one, she said, before their arrival there was 1932. So she saw that Elliot Merrick and Kate Austin had left their names in the bottle. Oh, here's a photo of uh, Barbara, Nora, and John. The women have covered themselves with flies. See the guitar? Guitar yeah. case there? And the falls behind them, Barbara, Nora, John, and the dog, Flop. And dipping water from Grand Falls. Um, sorry, I lost my spot here. Oh, yeah. They made lemonade with this dipped water, she said. And she said, the water drew us and made my knees weak. Flop didn't seem to know what it was all about. On September 1st, they had another lazy day. They did laundry and some mending, and they had goose for dinner and caught fish that afternoon, which they had for supper. Well, I, I should have shown you this photograph. This is uh, Russell and Barbara and Flop. And you can see he's holding the dog. The dog's probably a little bit freaked out. Uh, on September 2nd, they found Uncle Fred Gowdy's old tilt, which was falling in, and they started their return to the river. They had leftover goose for dinner, and Barbara said, the tent feels like home now. It was September the 4th when the men lowered the canoe down the portage and got it back into the river. On September 5th, she said Flop was asleep on her feet in the canoe as she wrote her notes. This wasn't that day, but there's she and Flop. And that night, they camped at Rabbit's Head near an old Indian camping ground. 
They finished paddling Lake Winnicka Pow the next day and they stopped at several trapper's tilts in a vain hope to find some salt. They were looking for some salt for their food. They ran the rapid at Devil's Hole and she said they could actually see the downward slope of the river. John picked up his canoe at Squirrel River. On September 7th, they left a note for Cyril Michelin at his tilt. It was so windy they put a sail up on the canoe. Barbara said they had lots of white horses licking our heels. They ran part of the Meninope Rapids, which were very low and rough. Barbara found the Middle Horseshoe Rapids were the loftiest, and she said the most fun. She figured they traveled as far in one day going downriver as they traveled in three and a half days going upriver. At Horseshoe, they met some Indians and they bummed a little sugar from them. On September 9th, they were back in Goose Bay, and she said it was a wonderful trip, but too short. In her diary, she did an account showing that she had paid $16 for the boat to Muskrat Falls, $35 for food. John Blake was paid $5 a day, plus 50 cents a day for the canoe, a total of $191.50. They didn't write a report for the Geographical Society, and there were no bells ringing out in tribute when they got back to Northwest River. <laughs> Barbara Russell, John, and Nora had gone up Grand River, seen the falls, and they did it the old-fashioned way, by canoe and foot, the same as all the explorers and the trappers before them. In their world, nothing remarkable had been accomplished. It had been a romp. Back home after almost a month away, John and Russell got ready to go back up the river again for the winter. Barbara went back to New York winter, and she returned to Labrador the summer later, and she married Russell. And then she went up and down Grand River two more times with him as she spent two winters with him on his trap line at Fig River. So that's my talk. Um, I've got some other pictures that she took. It doesn't relate to Grand River necessarily, but I just thought you might be interested in seeing some of these pictures. This was a, uh, a day for the annual Spring Fair in Northwest River. So those men in military uniform who come down from Goose Bay, the war wasn't over yet. This would have been probably in 1944-45. And they're having their uh, big social <coughs> gathering and auction and... It was a hospital. Yeah, yeah, that would have been July the 1st. There's the hospital. And um, that's a common tick that somebody's going to auction. As you can see in this picture, there's Reverend Burry. And he's going to sell this, this um, common tick to somebody. Crash boat crew being lazy. <laughs> they were probably up until 4 o'clock in the morning. Because in her diary, for all these parties and dances, and, well, all day long was the whole like family affair. And then the dance would happen at night, and it never stopped until 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. And then everybody had a mug up, and then they'd get a, a ride back to Goose Bay. Hands up anybody who's been at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara went across the river and took uh, some pictures, too. She said in, um, in her diary, she talked about, well, she sold fabric at the craft store. And as you can see, I mean, the two skirts are made from the same fabric. And she talked about how a woman would buy, you know, some yards of material and then it would be it would be hats, it would be skirts, it would be bags, it would be this, it would be that. So the same fabric showing up. And she mentions that summer, men moving a house. And the song, they were singing the Johnny Poker song for towing this house. Does anybody, I think she said whose house that was, I just forget now. I think it was to Harvey Gowdy, I think, had the house. Okay. It was an old mission house. Uh -huh. This is the trappers getting ready to go to Muskrat Falls portage. So they're loading their canoes in the boat and they're getting ready to go and there they are underway. I wish that picture was clearer but as you can see they're, they're underway. They got as many canoes as they could on the boat and then they towed the rest. And this is camp now. Barbara Bella, Bella McLean she was then. She was a Bella Shouse and um, a young woman from the United States uh, who was here that summer as a walk, the three of them went on the boat up to Muskrat Falls and stayed at the camp overnight to stay by the trappers, and then they came back in the motorboat the next day. And uh, that was two years before she did her trip with Russell. 
and up the river. So that picture was taken in 1944. Yeah, Mark Wheeler was the other one. Wheeler. Okay. I don't know who that is. Anybody recognize this man? With all his furs? It looks like he's talking on a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> This is Russell out of the country. Uh, Barbara had a good camera and she had some color film. And he was, I think in the first winter she was out there, they only ever butchered or, or killed one caribou. So looks like he, that's the day he had that caribou. There he is, <laughs> expanse of country. And here he is here. Mm -hmm. And there she is. She must have stopped to pick some berries, eh? I'm sorry this one's not better. This is her standing up here. It's too dark to see her. The little tilt is there, and there she is. There's her face. That's at Fig River. That was their main house, their biggest tilt. There's loaded canoes going up the river. I love that picture. I mean, there's six canoes in the picture. And Russell in the foreground. And of course she was in Russell. One of their tents out on the trap line. And there he goes. And the dog is pulling a little load. See the dog there, the two shadows behind Russell? He would tie up something in a seal skin and the dog would pull along behind them. And this is the diary she kept on the trap line. That's what it looked like. And behind it is a typed letter from one of her Dear Everybody letters that she wrote. So every single day she wrote in that picture. She was the third line down. Hmm? She was the third line down in the typescript or fourth line. Over here? Yeah. February the 28th. While Russell finished something, cutting the rifters for the new tilt. No, no, on the on the script. Oh, the type script. Oh yes, Edward Blake, Sid's oldest boy, and I started off as the sun was beginning to rise. The time you went hunting with her. I remember. Yeah. 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 That's it. Those are all my pictures. So I'm done. Thank you very much for listening. I'd be happy to answer questions if anybody has any. Or we can just you can just get up. The map is there. Uh, some of the early arrivals saw it. Um, Old River is laid out there. You mentioned um, Malone traveling with uh, with Derek Chris. Do you think that was the same Malone that traveled with uh, uh, in 1908 in the country with uh, Dylan Moss? It could be. I never thought about it. Yeah. I don't know. You could, yeah. It could be. 20, almost 20 years before, he'd be an old man. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I never saw any much, very much information on that group. And it seemed to me that some of these go up in the country. They didn't mention everybody. Like, they didn't mention everybody else's contributions. They sort of shone the light on themselves. It's like, me, 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 I did this, you know. So you, it could be. Some other historian will have to dig that one out. <laughs> anybody else want to say something? or <clears throat> The canoes that they used on the river had no keels. Ah. Because of the current. The current would pull the canoes around. They'd slide on the water, see? I, I don't know very much about canoes, and I was trying to figure out some stuff because I, I eventually learned that the some of the trappers made a canoe that they intended to be disposable. They were not going to bring it back down the river. They knew they were going to leave it up there. If they got some more use out of it, fine. If they didn't, fine. They hadn't invested very much energy in it anyway. And um, it's, um, oh, Joe Gowdy's brother, um, Horace. Horace, in his book, I think he says about how 
he and his father one year to be able to make some money by bringing some of the trappers' canoes down the river for them, right? Men had left up there thinking, well, that's gone, right? Because the bears had teared up and everything. But uh, Horace and his father brought some of those canoes down, and then guys paid them to get their canoes back. So, but Russell, when he went up with Barbara, he had canoes that he wanted to keep, and so he did a hard work, job of work, bringing them back down. And in my book, you know this, and there's photographs there, I think, showing him out on Winnicott Power, somewhere on, when it's frozen solid. And he's got Comatic, one canoe lengthwise and another canoe across it. And it's in February, and he brought them down the river quite a distance figuring he'd pick them up later on when they came down on foot. But he wanted to keep those canoes. But I didn't realize that sometimes canoes were just disposable. And apparently there must be lots of canoes left up in the country, or fragments of them. And yeah, the bears would tear them all up. Yeah, yeah. Nothing else? Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you very much for coming.